Well, BTR started about 11 or 12 years ago when Sylvester McCoy was the incumbent of the role. I was sort of, I got together with my cousins and my brother at Christmas time, around Christmas Day, and being that we we're all sort of Doctor Who fans, they were fans because it was the show to watch on TV in the late 80s. Um, we sort of got together and made these rather awful radio plays. Well, they were awful because they were very poorly acted improvised the whole way through and they only ever came to about five minutes and were always a condensed version of Genesis of the Daleks featuring the Seventh Doctor and Ace and Davros and one Dalek. So it was sort of a small beginning but the seed had been planted inside me. Well, sounds a bit like, bit like, like a bit of flannel but um, so then about 96 um, I got an, actually no, I was 97 I got an internet connection and um, decided to make my own website and part of it I thought well I could really try this audio thing again with some sort of do it properly because I was sort of doing drama at high school and thought well yeah I can I can have a decent go at this again and so I started work, reworking my Dalek script which eventually turned into Invasion of the Daleks and it gestated over time and then eventually VTOL came on board and Scott came on board in 1998 and eventually turned into the product we had and thanks to other people's involvement and my involvement with the pres as president of the Brisbane Doctor fan club I was able to sort of publicise BTI, which by that stage it was known as Back to Reality Productions. It got the name in, in late in yeah, late 1997, and so it sort of came from there, and we've sort of gone from strength to strength with moving from Invasion of Daleks to Sentinel, and then through to um, the Gallifrey recommencement. And in a few months' time, you'll see Darkness Falls, or hear Darkness Falls, as the case may be. How's the actual production done? Actual production done? Well. First, we start with the, the idea of the script, and that works through with the writer, and we develop the script, and that's done over several months. Like um, Invasion of the Daleks took about it, sort of from start to finish, was about two years worth of work. Unfortunately, it just didn't show in the final product. Even though it was an adaptation of a Terry Nation story. Yeah, well, because it was sort of I was in the middle of the throes of high school. It sort of was, and and because it was just me working, it was very much a small side project for me. It was never as big as what it was or is now. Um, so, and then Sentinel took a few months because I sort of started writing that as I was wrapping up writing Invasion of the Daleks. And so Sentinel was a bit quicker. Actually, VTOL ended up writing, I think, the last third of it just because I had come up with the idea of what was going to happen. But because I had just gotten so sick of writing scripts, because script writing is not my forte, I just don't like doing it. I'm good at coming up with synopsis, but it's just writing a script isn't my idea of a good time. So I left him to do it, and he came up with a really good ending and added all that stuff about the cyber conversion process, which was really good. I thought it was really well done. And so once we've got the script written, um, we go then go into the studio, and first over a couple of weeks we organise with the various actors that we've approached at BDWFC meetings to act out the characters. Um, we work out a time when we can all get together, a sort of a five or six hour block I try and aim for because to give the project justice you can't do it any shorter than that sort of time. So once we've got the actors in the studio we go through the lines, the director of whichever story um, we're doing makes comments and then we get up to the mic, check for levels, god this sounds like the big finish it does, DW, it? DWM, Doco. Yeah, well, we, well it's, it's, it's funny how all the different audio groups around the world, Floor 10, Season 27, BTR, um, Fine Line, we all use very much the same process. Obviously, different groups use different levels of equipment. Um, but I digress. Um, so we record the audio, check the levels, um, then we go through a scene at a time. It's pretty much, as Nick Briggs said, rehearse, record. Um, we rehearse the scene, and at probably pretty much at the same time, just due to lack of time, we check for levels while we're rehearsing the scene, and then go for the take. Pretty much, it's always a first take job, and um, we um, we never stop for technical reasons um, because we've got such a marvelous engineer in me. <laughs> and now that was a bit of flannel. Um, and so, yeah, once we, once it's all, once all the dialogue's recorded, it then goes through the edit process of editing overlaying sound effects and everything. And once I've got the scenes matched up sound effects wise and ambience and everything with what's in the script, what the director has specified, where what sounds they want and where they are, that usually takes about a day per scene, no matter regardless of the length of the scene. Um, once that's done, I then assemble all the scenes in their order and listen to it from start to finish. 
and realise where bits where I need music. Now, because we don't have a composer of our own, we've got to rely on the silver screen and BBC CD releases of the TV series music, which I think works because it adds an extra sense of familiarity to the project that people normally wouldn't have with the original scores. So once I've sorted out what music, like usually I stick to one story's music per hour audio project so that the style is the same all the way through, like Invasion of the Daleks, I use the music from Resurrection, Sentinel from Earthshock, and TGR from Planet of Fire so far. Um, Darkness Falls will be using, this is a bit of a spoiler, we'll be using the um, telemovie soundtrack for it because it's very much a sequel to the telemovie. That's not really giving too much of the plot away. But no, once that's done, then I edit it together, put all the music in, take the credits on either side, convert it to an MP3. Over the years, I've used different programs, always stepping up the quality, and then update the website to reflect the change and put the episode up and people listen to it. All right. And they're also available on CD. Yes, this is something which is only really done locally here. I've had actually had a couple of people from the US and even the UK ask for audio CD copies because they, they access the web at work and they can't get the download facility. So it is available over the web via CD. You've just got to email me to do it. Um, and they're pretty cheap. I mean, well, we obviously, because we're, we can't make any money off it, otherwise we'll be hearing from the BBC lawyers not too soon. But um, so, yeah, they're, they're available on CD. And the CD copies usually generally are of a higher quality than the MP3s because we are limited by server space and the amount of time that it takes to download an episode. I try not to push the MP3s over a 5 meg file size, whereas the original WAV files that I use to make the CDs up are usually around 55, 60 meg. In addition to all your other behind-the-scenes roles, you play the Doctor in this current season. Yes, well, this is something that several people have objected to. I don't know why. I mean... I'm as good a doctor as any of the other fan doctors. Well, maybe the only pedigree I don't have is I'm British. Um, but I don't see that it matters. I mean, the doctor is an international character. He's not. I don't think he should be confined to someone with a heavy British accent, sort of um, aristocrat type thing, which I think a lot of people have suggested I should try doing, just because it's more familiar as a stereotype associated with a British character. But the main reason I do it is well, because originally I started doing these on my own and um, I figured, well, why not, why, well, I suppose, why should I play the Doctor? Well, why shouldn't I? I mean, my justification is, is that um, I sort of run the whole show as it were. Um, I, I sort of, I, not to detract from the work that VTOLD and other, and, and our script writers have done, like Scott Marshall, um, I think my role is the one that involves the most work outside of the studio. Like script writing is something that you can do on and off and there's no sort of pressure to get it done in a certain time. Whereas once the material's in the can, people do tend to get a little anxious to hear the finished product and that's where the pressure comes into it. And so I sort of thought, well, I'd like to play the Doctor and that was why I started BTR in the first place. Sort of continue the adventures and to also be able to play the Doctor, something that every kid's wanted to do. So um, that's where it sort of stemmed from and um, we do have intentions to, well, this is once again a spoiler, a very spoiler down the way, we do have intentions to regenerate the Doctor into a tenth incarnation. I'm not telling who we're going to have as the tenth Doctor because we're not sure if he'll still be interested in doing it, but he is a professional actor. He works for La Boite Theatre in Brisbane and um, he's very eager to play the Doctor, and but we do have intentions, and the Doctor, the Ninth Doctor, is going to go out with a bang, not fall off an exercise bike in the console room, <laughs> or have something shoved in his heart or whatever by an American Doctor who whines a lot. Um, no, he will go out with a bang, and um, well, I suppose if you've bothered to download this file, you might as well have a bit of a reason to do it. He, at the moment, this is probably going to change tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, but. Um, he will die saving Gallifrey from some unseen enemy. Not Sirens of Time style. Yeah, they conquer the planet in 25 minutes. This is something that we're going to be building over a couple of seasons. And, well, insofar as this is what the current idea and theory is. But he will regenerate saving Gallifrey from this enemy. Sounds most promising. Hmm. What about some of the other work you've got planned for BTR to undertake? Well, we've got our first semi-professional audio, The Alien Factor, coming up. 
which we're actually recording in a few months' time. The script's finished. It's currently going through a bit of a polish and um, editorial type fix-up. Sounds so technical. Um, <laughs> but no, in fact, it recorded August this year, and it will be released in March 2001. It, we've actually stitched up a distribution deal with the Playtime Radio Network in Melbourne, who um, were are interested in broadcasting it on their radio station as well as um, taking stock of the audios of the Alien Factor series for their shop. It's a mail order shop. Um, now the first release will be a two CD set only because the first script that Vito wrote is too long to fit on one CD but mm, sort of not long enough to justify two full CDs so we're not sure what we'll be doing with the, the remainder of that disc. Um, maybe a behind the scenes look at it or whatever, a ba audio based similar to what Doctor Who magazine did for the Sirens of Time. Um, but it's sort of going to be very similar release schedule to what Big Finish did with the New Adventures of Professor Bernie Summerfield. We're looking at about three stories released a year, possibly more if the interest is there, because obviously it takes a lot of time if we want to do this professionally. Um, and because Vitol lives on the other side of the city, to me, it's a 45 minute trip to get around to my place to do work on it. Obviously being that it's his child, he's worked on it for seven or eight years, I think it is. Um, he will want to be heavily involved in the post-production process, which will be a, which will implement a delay in how long it takes. I've put aside six months worth of time to do the two CD set, which I think is more than enough. And we've actually got an original composer now working with us, or hopefully working with us, he's very interested in doing it. He primarily works with a saxophone and a piano, so if he is the one that we end up getting for it, to prove an interesting combination, an incidental music combination, of Day of the Triffids BBC TV series, which used a lot of the piano, and Happiness Patrol, saxophone blues type thing, which I think would be rather interesting. Matches the style of story that Vitol's come up with. It's sort of very much inspired, it's post Dark Skies type story, which I, I think is really good. There's a lot of room for a show like Dark Skies, but we're digressing off the point. And I also see on the uh, website you're playing a Blake 7 story. Yes, Blake 7 sequel. There's a lot of them about at the moment, and with the interest in the new TV movies, which the Dar Paul Darrow and Brian, um, Brian Lighthill, I think his name is, I think they're working on them now. Um, yes, we are planning a sequel. Now, at the moment, it's going under the title of Blake's Legacy, but there is actually another audio group, JM and KH Productions. If I got your name wrong, I apologise, but it is a very hard name to remember. Um, well, it's a couple of letters, but you know what I mean. Um, it, they've got a ser an audio series called Blake's Legacy, and we don't sort of want to... Obviously, there'll be comparisons to the two, between the two, because they've got the same name and everything. But then again, there are a lot of audio groups making Doctor Who stories, and we're all using the same title, and yes, there are comparisons. But I don't think it's such a bad thing. But I would like to have an individual title, and there's been several titles banded about. Blake's Legend was another one, Blake's Armoury or something, I don't know, but there's just a heap of them and it, it, we haven't even sit down, sat down and wrote any scripts yet. We've just come up with an outline for the first six-part serial and we know who the characters are and that sort of thing. And we've just got to sit down and flesh it out and hopefully that will be appearing soon, but that's sort of our third priority at the moment, audio story-wise. Would it still go ahead if the BBC go ahead with a new remake? Oh, definitely. The only thing that would happen, the only thing that would change would be, because um, our story is set 13 years after the events on Galda Prime, which is uh, what? Episode, the final episode of season four, Blake, um, which, let's face it, the planet sounds like a big wad of cheese. <laughs> um, so, yeah, on Gorgonzola Prime, they, um, <laughs> they had the big shootout, and so this is set 13 years after that final climatic scene, and obviously what we interpret as, ha as having happened in the meantime will be dictated by what, possibly altered by what the BBC decide to do with the, um, with the new TV movies. So it's a big wait and see, I think. Yes, we will be doing a Blake 7 sequel on audio, but how long it will be before it appears is anyone's guess.